Hello, welcome. Welcome. This is the global community for adult survivors of complex trauma. And, you know, <laughs> we have all been showing up here together for over six years, Monday nights, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. And I'm so honored to be here with you, so honored. Uh, we talk a lot about healing from complex trauma, ongoing, repeated relational trauma. And some of the main causes of complex relational trauma, um, also known as complex PTSD symptoms, uh, there are there are some main causes, some things that are the majority of those who read Pete Walker's work, uh, those who are familiar with CPTSD and CPTSD symptoms, many of us are adults who grew up in a situation where there was repeated relational trauma around us. Uh, we either witnessed abuse uh, in our family of origin, or we were unfortunately um, recipients of abuse in our family of origin. And the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences study, which was done back in the 90s, uh, breaks down adverse childhood experiences into three categories, abuse, neglect, and household family dysfunction. And uh, one of the one of the sort of subcategories of our community are those who have experienced attachment trauma. And we read a lot about attachment work. Attachment trauma happens in the very early part of someone's life um, from age zero to age 18 months, if there was a lot of abuse, neglect, neglect or other dysfunction in the, in the household with the primary caregivers um, within our nuclear family, our immediate family, then chances are we grow up to be adults who struggle in relationships. And we struggle in different ways. We struggle in our relationship with other people. We struggle in our relationship with ourselves. We struggle in our relationship with money and success or our career. Uh, we struggle with executive functioning, which is the, uh, the, the part of our lives where we are able to make sense of things, make lists. It's located in our prefrontal cortex, like towards our forehead. Uh, we struggle. We struggle to um, to organize tasks and organize things um, in in a way that makes sense and that is helpful for us. And there are um, huge parts of the complex PTSD sort of uh, population or community that have uh, been with us here on this channel for over six years, hanging out with us every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. We hang out, we talk about what works, what doesn't work, and um, typically, invariably, some of the things we do talk about are things that work and ways that we've been able to feel better, ways that we are able to connect with other humans, connect with ourselves, and enjoy our lives. And one of the most effective ways that complex trauma survivors are able to communicate and connect with others is by participating in some form of psychotherapy, whether that be talk therapy, um, whether that be art therapy or other forms of creative modalities. Um, there's a, a lot of different ways that one can connect with a helping professional. What we've learned over the last several years in studying all of this and in sort of participating in this community and, and showing up in a way that we hope is helpful and supportive 
uh, is we ask our community members, what are you curious about? What has been working? What do you struggle with? What are some topics that you wish we could cover or talk more in depth about? Um, and a lot of the emails we receive are about attachment trauma, early, 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 early childhood trauma, also known as preverbal trauma. Um, we have a lot of videos on this channel that sort of delve into these topics. Another topic that comes up a lot is the topic of boundaries. What's a boundary? I'm so ashamed. I don't know how to do boundaries. How come I'm in my 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and no one ever told me about boundaries? Or those who are teenagers and in their 20s, and they're just now hearing about boundaries for the first time, and they're wondering why no one told them about it. And then usually what ends up happening in that conversation is, one of our community members that's been around for several years is like, hey, I'm 65. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grandmother of four and no one taught me about boundaries. It wasn't until I was, you know, 40 something years old that I went to the library and saw a book on boundaries. So you're not alone. And, and it really is just such a, such a beautiful sort of organic mentorship or friendship that takes place in our community. So um, that's a little bit about who we are, what we do. Uh, repeated relational trauma is something that is unfortunately very common in the world. And I believe, uh, this is probably a lofty goal or belief, but I do believe that we can raise awareness about repeated relational trauma about complex trauma, about complex PTSD, about post-traumatic healing, and reach younger generations, and at some point, leave a legacy of healing for future generations and help younger, 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 younger community members, that we can reach a younger demographic, that we can eventually prevent complex relational trauma not 100 percent, obviously because we can't control others and we can't control how they're going to show up in the world but the thing that i'm the most hopeful about here is that if for someone to experience cptsd symptoms the the trauma needs to be repeated and involving another person and it needs to happen for a long period of time and they need to be sort of trapped and unable to get away from that and if we can educate enough people over time fewer and fewer and fewer people will participate in this type of abuse or trauma so so that's that's where i'm going with this and i'm just so honored to be here and i can't do any of this work whatsoever without the incredible volunteers that you see in the chat box right now with a little blue wrench next to their name. That's my blue wrench crew. Um, they have lovingly and fondly called themselves the blue wrench crew. And I just, I just love it. Uh, I can't do any of this work without them. So if you see someone with a little blue wrench next to their name, uh, in the chat box or in the comment section, if you could just say thank you to them, it's because of them that we are able to show up here week after week after week for several years and just hang out and help people out there in the world show up and find ways to be seen and heard within the context of safety. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Shannon and Poppy, Ninja Taco, John Harvey, and many others who are there in the Blue Ranch crew. And I, I'm super duper grateful for you um and for all that you do so we are going to talk tonight more we're going to do part two of the kathy malchiotti article um there is a pinned comment up at the top i believe it's the one let me see let me make sure the comment that I have. Oh, 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 oh. The comment that I have pinned to the top actually is not a link to the article that we're, that we're going through tonight. It's part two of the article we did last week, but the pinned comment at the top of the chat box is welcoming you to our new CBTSD community Facebook group because it is 
ready. We have the pictures hung and the furniture moved in and the rugs are just thrown around just so with huge floppy throw pillows and cuddly warm things and of course there's puppies and I get questions if there's going to be chocolate. Yes, there's chocolate. I believe we have lots of tea and comfort food and there are no unpleasant smells and no unwanted uh, people or touches or things, only things that you love. <laughs> And I hope that you enjoy and I look forward to seeing you and um, there are going to be um, many familiar faces and some new ones and I am I'm just super honored a special thank you to Poppy and just the entire team of volunteers that we have that are just helping with everything and making sure that the process goes smoothly so um However, the link to tonight's article, part two of the Kathy Malchiotti article, is in the description section of, um, of the video. And it's uh, located down in the second paragraph. A very special thank you to Dr. Kathy Malchiotti for her pioneering work and for providing the resources for today's video, Creative Arts Therapy and Attachment Work. Originally posted on Psychology Today, and I'm hoping that that link is helpful for you. Let me make sure the link is working. The link last week wasn't working correctly for some reason. Yay, it worked. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start uh, with today's article. And um, I just, but first, oh, before I get started, let me just see how many minutes we're in. I don't know how many minutes we are into the video yet, but let me say hi to everybody first, and then I will, uh, then I will begin the article. So uh, a very warm hello and welcome to John Harvey, Poppy, Taviba, Jeffrey Sherman. Let's see. Tara, hello. Oh, hello to VQ. <laughs> hey, Gabby. Hello, hello. Uh, hello to Julie Ann. Hello. Hello to Esther. Uh, <laughs> let's see who else I got here. Did I say hello to you, Ninja Taco? It's up for everybody. High five. <laughs> hello to Miss Shannon. Did I say hello already? I feel like I'm out of our, I feel like I'm repeating myself now. <laughs> hello to Lorianne and Diane. Hello to Nance. Okay. Hey, Andrew. Great to see you as always. Hello, hello. <laughs> hey, Nadine. Hello, hello. Hello to Marie. Marie's going to bring some butterflies. Yes, please. We would love some butterflies to go with all of our all of our fun snacks and puppies and throw pillows and fun rugs. Yes, with the chocolate. Of course you can bring your puppy, Tara. Hello. Oh, and an ocean view. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, you guys. Your emotional support puppy is totally welcome. John Harvey says, Athena, you had me at chocolate. <laughs> it's easy for me to make friends. I just, I say, hey, I have puppies and chocolate. Want to come hang out? <laughs> hey, Jess. Jess is in Iowa and is saying hi. I'm waving to you across the ocean and the plains. Jess, flower girl says hello. Hello to you. Hello, hello. Hello, user 22. I'm waving to you, user 22. Hello to Janelle. Hi. Okay, so now I'm going to read to you. Now I'm going to read to you. Again, a link to the article is in the description section of the video. And I believe Miss Poppy, Miss Poppy at 14 minutes after pasted a link to the video. So, or I mean, I'm sorry, to the article, to the article, to the article. Um, Oh, yes, Jeffrey Sherman. Most definitely Ocean View, tons of neuroscience info that we can nerd out on. 
And most definitely there will be mama bear, mama bear safe hugs. Yes, 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 yes. And Nadine, N Nadine's bringing some tea, chocolate and comfort food, which I will love to participate in. Um, someone needs to bring some vegan snacks because we have lots of vegans in the, his house. So, uh, Tara, will you bring some vegan snacks? I would love some vegan snacks. I think that would be super fun. And flower girl is bringing flowers for everyone. And I love me some flowers to go with the butterflies. Awesome. If someone could put, um, however many minutes we are into the video in the chat box, I would be super, uber, uber, uber grateful because it is very helpful for anyone who clicks on the video that isn't a member of our community already. And it's, they're like brand new. They like to be able to click on a number and have the topic start immediately. It is helpful for them. So that is what we will do. We will make sure. Um, Let's see here. So, oh, 1550. You're the bomb, Shannon. High five. Yay. I'm so grateful. Thank you, Nance. What would I do without y'all? Here we go. Creative art therapy and attachment work. Part two by Kathy Malchioti. Creative arts therapies are right brain to right brain interventions. We talked about this last week a little bit, but we're going to delve, we're going to delve deeper into it. So, Affect regulation simply refers to our ability to self-regulate and moderate our emotional self and our somatic responses to stress. Somatic responses to stress are simply our body's response to stress. So we're talking about self-regulating our emotions and then also what's coming up for us in our bodies. Sometimes our bodies will feel like hypervigilant or tense or uh, queasy, or there will be some other physical symptom. And then what we're talking about today is affect regulation, learning to self-regulate not only our emotions, but what's going on in our body as well, which sometimes deep breathing and mindfulness, these things can help, right? Hyper arousal, um, which hyperarousal is just a fancy word for a state of high emotion or somatic response, like our bodies and our emotions are responding at a heightened rate. This is often a common response in individuals whose attachment is insecure, disorganized, or disrupted. And for those of you um, who are unfamiliar with the terms insecure attachment style, disorganized attachment style, or disrupted attachment style, we did talk about this during last week's uh, CPTSD community live stream, which is here on the YouTube channel. And it, the thumbnail looks exactly the same, and it will say week one of two. And today's thumbnail will say week two of two. Okay? So, um, the heightened state of emotion or somatic response, also known as hyper arousal, is, um, is very common. Those of us with attachment trauma, uh, in particular, young clients who have experienced traumatic events, understandably, we have difficulties with affect regulation. Children who have been victims of interpersonal violence are particularly at risk uh, for problems with affect regulation, including hyperarousal and dissociation. So let's, let's pause here, full stop. So Dr. Malchioti is talking about hyperarousal in one moment and dissociation in another moment. So affect regulation is, um, our body's response. If, if our body and our emotions are sort of out of control and they're on hyper alert, Hence the word hyper arousal. In fact, that's a great way to put it. Hyper alert is a good synonym for hyper arousal, kind of like hyper vigilance. So if that's on one end of the spectrum, dissociation would be sort of towards the other end of the spectrum. And that's when we sort of are not fully present in our bodies. We're sort of feeling floaty or like things aren't real or we space out and it's not that they are both like uh, two sides of the exact same coin, but they're in the same family with one another. 
So on an implicit level, these children's worldviews, or those of us who grew up with attachment trauma, our worldview includes feelings of abandonment, lack of safety, and in order to stay safe, we often react with rage at anyone who is perceived as a threat, or we might become disengaged from people because someone or lots of someones um, have been around us and then abandoned us or hurt us, right? So we might perceive people um, as being unsafe and so we can either rage out at them or we become disengaged because our caregivers were very abandoning or very um, abusive and, or just otherwise dysfunctional, okay? So hypervigilance, hyper alertness, uh, dissociation, rage, um, sort of becoming very disengaged or shutting people out. All of these are, are common if you experience childhood trauma. So the treatment of attachment difficulties begins with the regulation of emotions, stress reduction, and the restorations of feelings of safety. Fortunately, specific applications of the creative arts therapies can be used to activate the body's relaxation response. Depending on the individual experiences with art making, music, and or movement can have a comforting and calming effect that decreases anxiety and fear. For example, even simple activities like drawing a picture of a pleasant time or hearing a soothing familiar song or story or rhyme are effective because the capacity of the imagination our imagination has an amazing capacity to recall sensory memories and details of positive moments. So creative arts activities may stimulate the placebo effect through mimicking self-soothing experiences for us, um, like relaxation, right? Self-soothing experiences, including relaxation. Now, keep in mind that many of us if we're in the midst of our healing journey of complex trauma, we may feel very averse or uh, to the idea of pleasant childhood memories. We might say something like, I have zero pleasant childhood memories. I don't have any good childhood memories. I don't have any good memories. It's all traumatizing and bad memories. I don't want to talk about my childhood. My childhood was so traumatizing and there are no good memories, right? Um, which is, I'm raising my hand over here. I've heard myself and I can think of times that I've said those things. Like, who wants to talk about childhood? I see all these movies with these people that have these like wonderful parents who show up for them and they buy them the ice cream cone or they take them to the amusement park or they do something sweet and kind or they take them shopping for school clothes or they go to the park or they play with their toys or they're doing arts and crafts together or these wonderful parents who are homeschooling their children and and they're going to the beach together and they go on family vacations and like they have family meals at at nighttime at the table and they're so kind and 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 it brings up you guessed it a lot of rage those types of things bring up a lot of rage in me and that's just me personally, me, Athena, the person that's talking to you in this microphone right now. Like that's a struggle for me because of my severe childhood trauma. Now through working with a trauma sensitive therapist, I have been able to learn to embrace and understand that 100% of my childhood memories are not bad. There are good ones in there that are hiding, but there is something that happens when someone is healing from childhood trauma, it's almost like they're afraid to remember any of the good memories because then if they, this is what happens a lot of times with complex trauma survivors. You're an adult because you clicked on a button that says, yes, I am over 18 years old and I'm listening to this. So I'm speaking to you right now. You're an adult. And there's something that happens with an adult that experiences a lot of pain and abandonment and frustration and sadness and then they learn about what boundaries are 
So in order to establish and maintain healthy boundaries with toxic people in our lives as adults, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it might necessitate us finding a way to get real mad and to be really angry about what we've gone through because that anger propels us forward in our healing journey to the point where we're able to be like, no, I'm not talking to those people. No, I'm not going to spend time with those people. I don't deserve that. No, I don't have good memories. I have bad memories. I don't deserve that. I'm doing what's best for me because nobody else ever did. And that is that, right? Like, Creating and maintaining those boundaries sometimes takes an act of the will because left of, left to our own devices, we will sit there and we will romanticize the family unit and we could romanticize abusers and enablers and we can see the good in them and believe that they are good and that they just were misled or misguided or misinformed or they made a mistake and maybe they're good and maybe they're going to change and the dangerous part about that is not only not only the cognitive dissonance and the uncomfortableness that comes with that but sometimes we're not strong enough to maintain those healthy boundaries and we end up getting re-victimized by the same people in adulthood that victimized us in our childhood. And that is a scary thing for an adult who is learning about boundaries. So what we find ourselves doing, even if we're in trauma therapy, is deleting in, in our like as much as we can. No, there's no, there are no good memories. There's nothing good. No, I don't remember that. No, those people are bad. Those people don't have boundaries. Those people are unkind. They're exploitative. They're abusive. They're neglectful. They're dysfunctional. They're 12 kinds of crazy. And I'm going over here and I'm going this way and I'm going to create a life that I enjoy and that I deserve because I deserve it because nobody else ever did it for me. And as long as we, which is totally fine, by the way, That's totally fine. This is like welcome to the human race, right? Because it doesn't make you a horrible person. That makes you human in that you are doing the only thing that you know how to keep yourself safe. As long as you know on some level that it's okay for you to change your mind a hundred times a day, every day, if there comes a point in your life that you decide that you want to be in touch with people and that you are in a stronger place where you're going to be able to advocate for yourself. The problem that happens with complex trauma survivors is we lose the ability to advocate for ourselves because of learned helplessness and because of hopelessness and because of re-victimization. And so sometimes that anger and that rage, uh, it, it propels us and it, it works. It, it gets this adrenaline going so that we can keep ourselves safe. Okay. So it's one of the ways that we find ourselves actually self-soothing. And I know that that doesn't sound self-soothing. It sounds very destructive or self-destructive because it's anger and anger only hurts the person that's angry. And at the yet while that might be true, and while yes, that is a true statement, it's also a true statement that someone who has had no one to advocate for themselves needs to find ways to advocate for themselves. And if the way that they find to advocate for themselves is focusing on the reality of what it is that they've gone through to motivate them towards creating a better life for themselves, then that, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. Okay. So just know that if you're in a place right now where you are needing to find ways to have brick walls for boundaries so that no one can hurt you, just know that that is 100% okay if that's where you're at. First of all, everything is welcome here. A feeling is a feeling. It's just an indicator and you're doing the very best you can. And if you didn't have people advocating for you, you need to learn how to be your own advocate. And sometimes we overcorrect. So me building up brick walls for boundaries, keeping out all the people, like all the people, that's that might be my step one. And then maybe my step 
uh, two is learning how to advocate for myself. And then maybe my step 4,275 is choosing to reconnect with some people that I put a brick wall boundary around because now I've spent years learning how to advocate for myself and tuning in and listening to my gut. And if something happens, I'm able to actually advocate for myself and not fall into a trap where I'm being re-victimized. So just know wherever you're at, it's okay to be wherever you're at. Okay. So that's a talk, a little bit of a talk about boundaries, which is what we're talking about next week. Um, but I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I just want to stick to the creative arts, um, activities that are going to, uh, stimulate self-soothing and it's going to help you relax. But I just, I need you to know that if you're in the middle of a shame spiral, because you're learning about boundaries and all the creative activities in the world are not helping, just know that it's just one moment in time. I promise you it gets better. Okay. So we're going to talk about, we're going to have week two and talk about creative arts for the second week in a row and expressive modalities. And next week we'll talk more about boundaries and you won't feel like you're flailing and, um, that you have no anchor and that you just don't know what you're doing. It'll all start to come together for you. The more often you show up for yourself, just know that I promise you, I pinky swear it gets better. I know it might feel a little swirly and you might feel a little wobbly right now. That's common. It's normal. It's okay. It's going to get better. Okay. So, um, for instance, um, uh, Dr. Malchiotti, Dr. Malchiotti talks about a well-known example of affect regulation, uh, via mimicry, like something that mimics, uh, soothing is a child who strokes a blanket or a toy in a way that mimics what would have been a caregiver's comfort. Uh, Creative arts therapies, especially with attachment disorders, seek to help individuals find activities that are effective in tapping positive sensory experiences that can be practiced over time and eventually become resources for us to regulate overwhelming emotions. So I'm pausing on the words overwhelming emotions and talking about mimicry and like and self-soothing and the blanket and the, perhaps the, the cuddling. I, I need you guys to know that w- wherever you're at with this is a hundred percent. Okay. And sometimes, um, particularly my male clients and our male community members, those who identify as male, they struggle a little bit with the self-soothing. They think it makes them soft or weak or sissies. And this is, this couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, perfect example is, um, something I've always done my whole life. Um, and I didn't realize I was doing it. I didn't receive a lot of comfort when I was younger. Um, I received a lot of opposite of comfort. I received a lot of discomfort. Um, so as an adult, I've always, if I'm ever sitting down and watching a movie, I always cuddle with a blanket. Like I always, even if it's like 90 degrees out, it doesn't matter. Like I have like a cotton, like a sheet that has like material sewn to it. So it's, you know, it's cool to the touch and I snuggle with it, um, while I'm watching a movie or watching television, or even while I'm working sometimes, I just, I snuggle with this blanket. Um, it's just, it's what I do. I've always done it. Well, I went to visit my son and my daughter-in-law this past weekend. Um, and it was so interesting, um, for me to see them interact with one another my son snuggles with a blanket like a hundred percent of the time. Like if he's watching a movie or watching television, he has this blanket that he snuggles with. And I was like, wow, that is so cool. Like that I, and I was, I was just interested in just sort of witnessing him in that. Like, I didn't say anything about it. Like, Oh, I like your blankie. (laughs) I didn't say that, but I thought, gosh, I, I do the same thing. That's so interesting that he does that. And his wife does it as well. Um, and it's, it's just, I don't know how many of you do that. Like, do you have like a blanket or something that you, that you snuggle with, like while you watch television or while you watch a movie or curl up and watch, um, like instructional videos on YouTube, or if you're watching Netflix, or if you're reading a book, like, do you snuggle? Is there like a favorite garment 
that you snuggle with? Do you have favorite socks? Do you have a pillow? Do you have a, a stuffed animal, a stuffy? Um, I would be interested to hear um, your self-soothing practices because I found it so interesting to look over at my son, who's almost 30 years old, and go, wow, he does the exact same thing I do. I wonder if he learned it from me. That's so interesting, you know? So anyway, I'm going to continue on with Dr. Malchiotti's article. She says, repetition of pleasurable experiential activities can become a source of self-soothing and the arts often allow people to experience themselves differently and in positive ways. Through carefully chosen opportunities for self-expression, individuals are able to exhibit and practice novel and adaptive behaviors, including the ability to induce calm feelings and self-soothe. Interpersonal neurobiology, as described by Bonnie Badnock and Dan Siegel, refers to an overarching theory that weaves together many strands of knowledge, including attachment research, neurobiology, and developmental and social psychology. It's based on the idea that social relationships shape how our brains develop, how our minds perceive the world, and how we adapt to stress throughout the lifespan. In the field of counseling, the creative arts in counseling are defined as inherently relational approaches to treatment. Relational therapy is historically defined as an approach that empowers individuals with the skills necessary to create productive and healthy relationships. In brief, all psychotherapy and counseling are relational approaches because the outcome of intervention is dependent on the core relationship between the therapist and the client. Most therapy also addresses disruptions in relationships such as acute or chronic trauma, loss, or attachment disruption. While all the creative arts therapies can be used with a goal of enhancing relationship, dance and movement therapy is most often used to address attachment issues because it focuses on the body. For example, mirroring is commonly used to establish and enhance the relationship between the individual and the therapist. The goal of mirroring also, um, it mimics attunement. She's probably going to go into attunement here in a moment, but mirroring is when you are talking with another person and you are, you're, you're having eye contact and your mirror neurons are being lit up. And this mimics attunement, which is what, um, hopefully is happening when you're younger from age zero to 18 months, you have someone to give you eye contact and to smile at you so that you can mirror the smile. And so you can, um, have those mirror neurons lit up and connect and attach. The goal of mirroring is not imitation of movements, postures, facial expressions, and gestures, but to achieve a sense of connection and understanding between the client and the practitioner. This is also a form of nonverbal right hemisphere communication that naturally occurs in secure attachment relationships. Through gestures, postures, and facial expression between a caregiver and child, dance movement and drama therapy in particular stimulate this type of relationship between individuals. Relational aspects are evident in art, music, and drama therapy also. In art therapy, a therapist is a provider of material, of materials, a nurturer, assistant in the creative process, and active participant in facilitating visual self-expression. These are experiences that emphasize interaction through experiential, tactile, and visual exchanges, not just verbal communication between the client and the therapist. Music therapy provides similar experiences through interaction with music making. It also has the potential to tap social engagement and communication when collaboration or simultaneously playing instruments is involved. Ask a music therapist and they may tell you that vocalizations are particularly effective in stimulating a sense of affiliation and relationship and that experiences in involving specific music inherently can calm and self-regulate. Finally, drama therapy offers multi-sensory ways to establish relationship through role play, 
mirroring and enactment and often includes other creative arts and play to support and enhance attachment. What I continue to find exciting about applying the creative arts therapies in my work is the growing understanding of these approaches as brain-wise interventions when used in purposeful ways. These creative approaches are compatible with what we currently understand about neurobiology and attachment, capitalizing on nonverbal and right hemisphere communication, active participation, and the self-soothing nature of creative expression through images, sound, movement, and enactment. Most importantly, the creative arts therapies are a way to experience a secure relationship with a helping professional that resonates on a sensory level in both the mind and the body and in a place within each of us where attachment is most authentically recognized, integrated, and appreciated. Be well. Kathy Malcioni. So I really, really hope you guys enjoyed these two articles from last week and this week. I really enjoyed them a lot. I enjoyed sharing them with you. Um, It's very exciting to me to be able to participate in conversations like this um, with you guys because we always want to be building our understanding of ways we can connect with others. And um, it is... I think super important for us to know that our body has its own way of expressing how it's feeling. Um, And the more and more and more we can become attuned to how our body is experiencing another person, um, then the deeper our healing is going, is going to be. So, for instance, let's say, um, let's say you are around a group of people sometime in the future, uh, let's say in a year from now, or when we're allowed to gather in larger groups, that you find yourself um, at a class, like at university, or perhaps at a community uh, recreation center at a game, like a, a game night or, uh, participating in some, some form of a group activity. Like, let's say it's like through your work or something like that. Um, and your body has, I'm just going to use this as an example. Let's say your body has a particular aversion or reaction to one of the people in the group. It's really, really, really important for you to remember this conversation we're having because your body is super duper duper smart. And if your body has a natural aversions, if your body has natural aversions to certain people and it reacts physically, like in a somatic way, uh, to certain people, it's important that we learn to find a way to listen to that and it's important that we become experts at advocating for ourselves okay Uh, particularly if we had very few people in our lives that were advocates that were advocates for us who advocated for us and um, if we experienced abuse neglect and other types of household dysfunction within our family of origin so Um, so yeah, it's really, really exciting. It's exciting to have these types of discussions and let me just check and see how you guys are doing. Wow. Thanks for all the thumbs up, you guys. It really helps so, 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 so much. Uh, it lets YouTube know that they're, that we're doing a good thing and that, and that, um, we're making a difference and then they, Make sure that our videos are showing up in the recommended videos uh, for we can reach more more people. So um, 
So yeah, so thank you so much. I'm so grateful for each of you. Hey, Miss Kira, long time no see. So good to see you as always. Hello, welcome back to Victor. Hey, Ninjitako. Hello, Michaela. Hello to Angela. Great to see you as always. <laughs> oh, it's so good to be here with you all. Let me get a sip of water. Hey, Tracy. Oh, Tracy says I still sleep with my blankie. And I'm always struggling with blankets when I'm on the couch. Snuggling. Me too. Me too, Tracy. Oh, Gobby says, Gobby says I, I sleep hugging a pillow. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, Angela has a stuffed bear, a stuffed rabbit that, I, that she snuggles with when she's asleep or when she feels bad. She says, I want to get a weighted blanket eventually. I think Gobby's bringing all of the weighted blankets to our safe space. <laughs> to our community. Our Facebook group. Gotta bring some snacks too. Michaela says, I use a weighted blanket and a compression vest. And just recently, I adopted a sweet dog to train as a psychiatric service dog. She's a perfect match. Naturally calm and cuddly. That is so awesome, Michaela. Nance has a body pillow. Gobby says, wow, I always have a blanket with me. I even work with one on my lap. I never thought about it like this. I know, isn't it cool? So cool. If we're, we're figuring out ways to self-soothe and you know, it's never too late. It's never too late to learn how to self-soothe. Nadine says, one step at a time. Ninja Taco says, I'm snuggling with a stuffed animal. That's awesome. Nance says, our dad told us that crying was for sissies. My sister and I had attachments to stuffed animals and blankets. I'm sorry you were told that, Nance. That is so wrong. It's, it's part of the reason why we're struggling as a culture, I believe. Because tears are very cleansing and they're absolutely welcome and they're, they're, um, they're necessary for us to heal. VQ says, me too, Athena. I always have a blanket on me. And I'm in Arizona. <laughs> it's warm in Arizona, huh, VQ? I'm so glad you have a blanket. That's awesome. Oh, Angela, it's great to see you also. <laughs> You're very welcome, Ninja Taco. You're very, very welcome. Yeah. Poppy says, I'm not ashamed, but what Athena is saying is true. Anger is needed. I had no access to my anger and I was stuck. Same here, Miss Poppy. Same here. I had no access to my anger. Um, I was very afraid of it and I didn't know that I was afraid of it, but I had no access to it. I just... I moved from confusion directly to compassion. I skipped over all the healthy emotions in between. So I found myself feeling in therapy so confused, like younger parts of me, like inner child work confused. Like, I don't understand. Why were they so mean to me? I don't understand. Why would they not be nice? I was their child. I was just a kid. I don't understand. It's so confusing. It's so confusing. And then deductive reasoning and through 
one of my therapists explaining to me that they came from a troubled upbringing and that they were abused as children and that they were doing the best that they could and that they were just repeating, um, you know, what was done to them. And like, it was almost like this one particular therapist was like, advocating for my abusers it was very unhelpful and it was not a good portion of therapy that I received I mean I'll take the good with the bad you know like it was definitely just not where I it wasn't the level of support that I needed at the time um it ended up doing a little bit more harm than good because I went from confusion as to why I was abused to compassion uh for what they had gone through and I was unable to feel not okay with the abuse that I endured. It was almost like that didn't even, it wasn't even a factor. I never even considered that it wasn't okay. That abusing children wasn't okay. Then I happened to be one of the children, you know? It never really occurred to me because I was so confused. Like, I don't understand. I mean, if they really knew me, if they understood what how much pain they were putting me through, they surely wouldn't have done it, done that. I mean, and my therapist confirmed that because she's like, you know, they were doing the best they could. Like, what if that was all they knew? And I'm here to tell you guys right now that while that might be a true statement, it might not be the most helpful statement for your therapist to make to you. Um, it may keep you stuck for decades like it did me. I was literally stuck for more than a decade uh, because I thought my therapist was basically telling me that I needed to be more understanding and forgiving because this particular therapist was someone through my church and the church teaches you that um, that you've been forgiven much and so you need to be forgiving and while that also can be a true statement it doesn't negate the natural feelings that come up about seeing someone harming a child. So the confusingest part for me as someone who wanted to be forgiving and I wanted to reconcile with my family of origin is that I could say with all honesty that abusing children was not okay and it was unacceptable and it was uncalled for, and it was inhumane, and it was a crime, truly. The level of abuse we were talking about was criminal. And yet, um, like fast forward a few therapists, probably like my third therapist, um, actually that was my second therapist. And so fast forward, my first therapist was through, a, it was a community therapist, like a social worker. And, um, and then my second therapist was the one that was through my church. And then fast forward, um, like to my, like my third therapist, like she sort of solidified that, you know, they were doing the best they could, etc. It wasn't until I found my therapist that I have now, um, that I was able to go, wait a second, wait a second two things can be true at one time. Like, yes, it creates cognitive dissonance. It creates confusion and uncomfortable feelings, but it's a true statement that, um, my parent, my parents probably thought that they were doing the right thing and maybe they were doing the best that they could. Maybe that's a true statement, but what's also a true statement is that abusing and neglecting children is never okay. And that, Um, committing crimes against children, regardless of what your upbringing was, is not a reason or a viable excuse or something to point to. And so while I was able to sit with my therapist and be outraged and angry for things that were going on in the world present day, particularly crimes against children, I was unable to apply that anger to myself. Um, because I was taught that it was wrong, that I needed to be forgiving and that anger was not welcome. And so it really took a lot of deprogramming 
and unlearning. And that's not something that is comfortable. Deprogramming and unlearning is hard. Um, because it, a lot of what you need to deprogram from and unlearn are, are super glued and velcroed and tied up with string together with things that are actually really helpful and positive things that you may have learned along the way, whether that be in Sunday school or church on Sundays or through studies or camp or whatever. Um, I, I just have started to learn over the past several years that I can't swallow the whole thing whole. I can't take this big, huge thing that is someone's belief system and swallow it whole, including all the things that are on the inside. I have to pull it apart piece by piece and find out what applies to my unique individual journey because there are between seven and eight billion different possibilities of healing, like healing journeys on the planet. And mine is not going to be identical to anybody else's. And um, while my worldview may be similar to many in whom I have fellowship with or community with, it doesn't mean that the inner workings of everything are going to be identical. Because I need to find what feels safe and congruent to me for my unique individual situation. And each of you, I highly recommend and encourage you to do the same. Find what works for you. Find the things that you believe to be true, that are helpful, and that feel safe for you. Because you're worth advocating for. And what good is a belief system or a worldview if you swallow it whole and some of the parts on the inside are poison. Um, we have to, we have to vet everything. We have to test everything. We have to look at each individual ingredient and we have to figure out if it's something that applies to our unique individual journey, kind of like food allergies. You know, a lot of people love cake, um, but you can't necessarily attend a party and just go eat anyone's cake willy-nilly without knowing what's in it if you are a person with food allergies. So if we're going to, you know, stick with the same metaphor, even though you all are so gracious in understanding me and all of my mixed metaphors, but right now in this cake metaphor, if we're all going to attend a party and we all want cake. We need to know what's in it. We can't just show up to any party anywhere and swallow the cake whole, particularly if we have food allergies. And guess what? Complex trauma survivors, we all have unique individual things that are involved in our healing journey. Things that were done to you, things that you lived through, things that you're healing from, Many of those things might be different than theirs or theirs or his or hers or mine or, you know, it's all different. It's all unique. So before we swallow anything whole, let's make sure we know what's in it. Okay. Because we're, we're worth advocating for. If you had a niece or a nephew or a child or a grandchild who had a peanut allergy, you would never show up at a party and allow them to go running towards the snacks and gobble up whatever they wanted because you would know that your niece, your nephew, your grandchild, or your child could end up dead. And you would care so much about their well being that you would ask the person who is putting on the party what is in the snacks or you would probably bring safe snacks for your niece your nephew your grandchild or your child because you care so much for them and my challenge to each of us is to care about ourselves that much when it comes to the activities that we participate in the relationships we participate in the ways that we advocate for ourselves 
the boundaries that we're learning about and asserting and maintaining. Which I guess is a perfect segue because this coming Monday on the 15th uh, of, uh, let's see, let's see, the 15th, yeah, 15th, we will be talking about boundaries. And it's going to be helpful for anyone who's just learning about boundaries or for those of us in our healing journeys that are um, doing our best to assert and maintain healthy boundaries with toxic individuals in our lives. Um, yeah. So... Um, there are going to be uh, some great resources shared from Annie Wright. I don't know how many of you are really familiar with Annie Wright, um, but I'm excited to be sharing um, be sharing her resources with you next week. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for caring enough about yourself to advocate for yourself. And I hope you enjoyed the, the two-week discussion on expressive modalities and art and the way that we, um, you know, the way that we interact with others and in nonverbal ways, the right brain to right brain communication. Um, it's always really, really enlightening and a uh, very special thank you to my Blue Wrench crew, Poppy and Shannon. Ninja Taco, John Harvey, I think I saw Miss Kira up in here. So I can't do any of this without you all. I'm super duper grateful. And our new Facebook community, there's a there's a pinned comment at the top of the uh, chat box letting you know that our um, new CPTSD Facebook community, you can find it, there's a link in the chat box. Um, at four minutes after or at the very 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 top as a pinned comment um super exciting <laughs> uh, but also there's a link in the uh in the description section description second section of the video as well along with a link to dr malchiotti's article and um yeah so I'm just so super grateful for this community. This this community has um, been such a blessing to me in my life and has uh, enriched my life in ways that are um, indescribable and <laughs> saved my life more times than I care to admit because it's been several years. Um, and this coming summer, we will have all been together for over seven years. So uh, thank you all so much. I look forward to... Um, I look forward to seeing you in the, in the Facebook group when I'm able to make my way over there. I'm in all these, all these different groups and I'm doing my best to consolidate. So, uh, be kind and gentle with yourself, please, uh, because you're worth it. And just thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you next Monday and every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Good night, everybody.